right. I'm going to start today with part one of our Pathogens 101 webinar, Manure-Borne Pathogens That Make People Sick. So what's a pathogen? It's any microorganism or virus that has the ability to cause disease. Um, some pathogens are highly virulent, meaning that exposure to even a few microorganisms can result in sickness. And for others, you need to be exposed to a lot before you get sick. The pathogens that we'll focus on today are those that are associated with manure, manure management systems, and the surrounding water, air, and soil. They're spread via direct animal contact, land application, aerosols, leakage or overflow from storage lagoons or treatment ponds, and runoff. There are a few main types of pathogens, and we'll cover most of these today, starting in the left-hand corner and moving clockwise. Um, Dr. Brooks will cover manure-borne viruses and parasites that make humans sick. I'll cover manure-borne bacteria that make people sick. And Dr. Loy, who will be speaking next, will close. Well, he's not going to be closing. He's speaking next by covering all three of these pathogen types from the veterinary perspective. You'll see I've added antibiotic-resistant bacteria. These are technically not pathogens. Most agricultural or environmental bacteria, they can't make people sick. So they're not pathogens. But since antibiotic resistance is a health concern, these bacteria often get grouped with the, with the pathogens because they're considered potentially harmful. And if it's the pathogen itself that's resistant, um, then that can cause additional concerns. The bacteria I'll be talking about today can cause fever, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, and abdominal pain, um, sometimes severe disease resulting in death in humans who are directly or indirectly exposed to contaminated manure. Um, and, and the group of organisms I'm talk, talking about today are, are classified as zoonotic pathogens. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time today talking about the top five manure bacteria that make people sick. We're going to start at the top of the list with the number one pathogen today, STEX, Shigatoxigenic Escherichia coli. Um, CDC estimates 265,000 STEC inf infections occur each year in the United States. 36% of these infections are STEC 0157, which you can kind of consider the Michael Jordan of the STEC team. Um, it showed up around 1983 with a jack-in-the-box outbreak, and it was the primary STEC of concern until the 1990s when the other all-stars joined the team. Uh, sometimes they're called the Big Six STEC, sometimes they're called a non-0157 STEC. The STEC are named with an O, actually all E. coli, I have a name that starts with an O, that's the letter O, and then a number. So the first one they found, they called O1, and then O2, O3. So O157 is the 157th different type of E. coli that was found. So that's kind of um, how these things got their name. Cattle are considered the primary reservoir of STEC, and cattle products continue to be implicated in STEC outbreaks. Great strides have been made in the industry, especially post-harvest processing to control this pathogen, but it's ubiquitous in cattle, and it remains a challenge for processors, food safety, and public health professionals. It's thought to have a very low infectious dose with only 10 organisms able to cause disease. And they got that number from calculating back, um, there was a dry salami outbreak uh, that they used to calculate that number. Studies that I've worked on in state and county fair animals show an individual animal prevalence of about 11% in cattle. So what that means is 11% of all the cattle sampled were positive for STEC 0157 on the day of sampling. These rates fit in with other individual and long-term surveillance efforts. They have about 13% of individual animals positive at any one time. An animal can be shedding for a short period of time and then not shedding. And uh, so shedding is sporadic. And the rates are generally higher in the summer compared to the winter. If we look on the fair level, 97% um, of the fairs we visited contained at least one STEC 0157 positive animal. So it's a common bacteria in ag settings. In addition to cattle, swine, sheep, and goats 
also excrete this pathogen. Goats are a particular problem, especially when it comes to petting zoos and other, other animal contact events. And I'll have a slide on that later. The first STEC 0157 outbreaks were associated with ground beef, and this continues to be an important vehicle for this pathogen to come into contact with people. Listed here are recent STEC outbreaks associated with ground beef. Now, it turns out that the main way that the pathogen gets onto the meat is not through direct fecal contamination. Instead, the primary source of STEC on beef is the animal hide. So the excreted manure contaminates the hide, which in turn contaminates the meat. Starting in the 1990s, public health officials started to see STEC 0157 outbreaks occurring not only in beef, but in a variety of other products, including spinach. And there's been a number of high-profile spinach outbreaks. You might remember some of these. These are a particular problem for growers in California where produce operations are in close proximity to cattle operations. And another common challenge as far as STEC and spinach is for organic growers who use manure as a soil health amendment um, and as a fertilizer for their crop. In addition to spinach, lettuce and other leafy greens are common sources of STEC outbreaks. There have been a variety of food products associated with STEC outbreaks, and the one that I personally find most surprising lately was a recent outbreak in flour. Um, so uh, this was a 0121 and 026 outbreak. There were 63 cases in 24 states, and uh, just another uh, reason not to eat raw cookie dough or raw batters. So I mentioned uh, goats earlier, and they're almost exclusively responsible for the numerous fair and petting zoo outbreaks um, over the years. These outbreaks give us an opportunity to look at survival of the pathogen in the environment over time. So the photo here that you see with the squares, that's a site at the North Carolina fairgrounds um, and their first outbreak. We were able to retrieve the outbreak strain from the soil months after the outbreak occurred. There had been rain and snow and it was freezing and we we're still able to culture the outbreak strain. So in some instances, uh, these pathogens are able to persist in the environment for extended periods of time. The two girls pictured here visited the fair with their grandparents. One was frightened, ended up being carried by her grandpa the entire time. She did not get sick. Her sister, who enjoyed interacting with the goats, was one of the people who was hospitalized. So it's a clear anecdotal evidence of the role of direct animal contact in transmission of the pathogen. The shoe here is from a public health worker who realized that she and her son had gone to the implicated petting zoo. She sent me the shoe, and I was able to pull the outbreak strain, pulse field typed outbreak strain, off of the shoe. So there's many ways for manure-borne bacteria to move through the environment. And uh, fairs continue to be an important way that people come in contact with manure-borne pathogens. And then closing out the Aztec story, um, a tale from 2000, uh, the Walkerton E. coli outbreak in Canada. The contamination came from a public water supply and was li linked to an upstream beef producer. There were over 5,000 people sick with seven deaths, so a real tragedy. And the situation was made worse by a cover-up that landed two public water commission people pictured here in jail. Um, this outbreak really brought home to the public health community uh, the potential for surface water um, contamination from ag sources. So moving on to number two on the list, salmonella. Um, salmonellosis is estimated to cause more than 1.2 million illnesses. Uh, it most often causes gastroenteritis, which can range from mild to severe. There's also an invasive form, and those infections are rare, but can be life-threatening. There's many different types of salmonella, and listed here are some of the main ones that cause disease in humans over the last couple of years here in the United States. As a side note, it's common to name the cerevar after the place where it was first isolated. So you'll see some geographic names that you might recognize when you're working with salmonella. The main carriers of zoonotic infection are poultry, and outbreaks are associated with a wide variety of foods. Um, 
So birds and reptiles naturally carry many types of salmonella in their intestines, and poultry aren't the only source of salmonella. It can be isolated from cattle, sheep, and pigs as well. The poultry are an important source. Salmonella is a very hardy and cosmopolitan pathogen. Uh, if we look at outbreaks from just this year, 2016, there have been multiple salmonella outbreaks associated with backyard chickens. There was an outbreak associated with a dairy bull calf, shell eggs, alfalfa sprouts, and alfalfa sprouts are a common vehicle for all kinds of foodborne pathogens. Um, a raw protein shake, shake mix, a pork served at a Hawaiian luau, potato salad, and pistachios. And that's not even all of them. That's 2016. Other common food vehicles, almonds, nut butters, and tahini are commonly associated with salmonella outbreaks. And on the produce side, cucumbers and cantaloupes have recently been vehicles for the pathogen. So the problem reaches beyond just animal products. Manure and manure-impacted soils are an important potential route of contamination of fro fresh produce. Looking at fare prevalence, 91% of the fares that we had um, gone to, uh, we found uh, at least one animal that was positive for salmonella. And grouping all the animals together for ease, about 20%, 19.1% uh, of the animals uh, were positive for salmonella. The infection, infectious dose uh, can range from as low as 10 to as high as 100,000 cells. It depends on the serotype. And the transmission is primarily foodborne, but about 10 to 15 percent of the cases are attributed to direct contact. So that's um, not necessarily direct contact with production ag animals. It can also be direct contact from uh, backyard poultry or from pet reptiles. Oh yeah, and the closing slide as a bonus, um, numerous studies indicate that salmonella can survive for at least several days, and sometimes for as long as nine months on all kinds of things, insects, rodents, surfaces of building materials such as wood, concrete, iron, steel, and brick. Number three, Campylobacter. Campylobacter is among the most common causes of diarrheal disease in the United States. It has an infectious dose between 100 and 500 organisms. And the main route of transmission is through undercooked meat that has become fecally contaminated during slaughter and processing. In one study, 59% of the poultry samples were positive for campy, compared to 3.5% of the beef samples. In another study, a consumer study, 80% of the poultry purchased at retail outlets was found to be contaminated with Campylobacter. So poultry are an important vehicle here as well. Even though only a low percentage of beef samples have been reported to be contaminated with Campylobacter, an early waterborne outbreak in the late 1990s put dairy operations on the map as a potential source of Campylobacter. In addition to poultry, campy outbreaks are associated with the consumption of raw milk and raw oysters. And this is an interesting one. In 2014, there was a campy outbreak at an adventure road race in Nevada. 20 people got sick. Um, these kinds of races are becoming more popular and provide a way for people to come in intimate contact uh, with manure-impacted soils. So just something to be on the radar. Number four, Yersinia enterocolitica. Uh, that's, a, that's a mouthful. Uh, this particular foodborne pathogen has some nasty relatives, including the famous Yersinia pestis, the cause of plague. So to distinguish, we use its full name, Yersinia enterocolitica. It causes, as its name suggests, colitis or intestinal distress. The main vehicle is undercooked pork, particularly pork intestines prepared as chitterlings. Occasionally, animal contact or untreated water is the cause of an outbreak. The major reservoir for Yersinia enterocolitica are pigs, um, but other animals can carry it as well. And unlike the ones we've seen before, this one has a relatively high infectious dose. 
Most of the Yersinia enterocolitica isolates recovered from environmental samples have been non-pathogenic, but pathogenic Yersinia enterocolitica has been detected in environmental surface waters, particularly streams. Number five, last on the list for today, is listeria. Listeria um, can impact both agricultural animals and humans. They're both susceptible um, to this pathogen, which is widely present in the environment. It's a particular problem for people who are immunocompromised, including people who are on chemotherapy, the elderly, and pregnant women. Pregnant women are 10 times more likely than other people to get listeria infection, and pregnant Hispanic women are 24 times more likely than other people to get listeria infections. Pregnant women with a listeria infection can pass the infection to their unborn babies, and it can cause miscarriages, stillbirths, and preterm labor. Um, it can also cause serious illness and even death in newborns. The fatality rate for listeriosis infections is 20 to 40 percent. Um, so this is a serious pathogen. The main route of transmission to humans is foodborne with deli and processed meats and cheeses um, being the products that present the highest risk. Queso fresco, for example, has been associated with a number of listeria outbreaks in the past. And um, individual food choices uh, are suspected to play a role in, in the higher prevalence of this disease in pregnant Hispanic women. Vegetables can become contaminated from soil or from manure used as fertilizer. And there was an outbreak this year in 2016 in frozen vegetables. Outbreak this year in unpasteurized milk. Actually, outbreaks a lot of years in unpasteurized milk. There was an outbreak in caramel apples in 2014. And then my last slide for listeria here. The largest listeria outbreak in recent history was a 2011 cantaloupe outbreak. 147 illnesses in 28 states and 33 deaths. Um, the rough cantaloupe rind, you can see here the roughness of that rind um, as the melon rests on the ground. It can pick up and then harbor pathogens that stick around even when the rind is scrubbed or bleached. Then upon slicing, the pathogen is introduced into the flesh of the melon where it can grow. It can grow happily. Um, so as a, a side, a food safety note, eat cut melon right away or refrigerate it. And refrigerate it for no more than seven days. Uh, also throw away cut, melon, cut melons that are left at room temperature for more than four hours. One thing that's unique about listeria is that unlike the other four pathogens today, listeria can grow at refrigerator temperatures. So that's why after seven days it still looks fine in the fridge, but toss that cantaloupe out. It's just not worth the risk. Um, this is also the, the, its ability to grow at refrigerator temperatures is also one of the reasons that the deli meats and cheeses are a problem for listeria. Um, the products get contaminated after processing because listeria is also somewhat ubiquitous. Um, and then even though they're stored in the refrigerated deli sections, the listeria organism can continue to grow. So in closing, after describing the problem, I'll leave you with a slide with some solutions. And um, take home message as far as this slide is concerned, the best management practices, they will prevent pathogens from leaving livestock operations and potentially contaminating food or water supplies. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you.